Delving into ancient Jewish texts and deciphering Hebrew's hidden meanings, Rabbi Daniel Lapin welcomes you to Tower of Power, decoding the secrets of Babel. Now, here is today's program. Well, hi. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lapin, and this is my wife, Susan, the mother of our seven homeschool children. A few years back. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that at all. But um, nonetheless, we are, uh, uh, our ministry, Rabbi Daniel Lapin, uh, is r focused on bringing ancient Jewish wisdom and making it accessible to you and you and all of you. Everybody should be able to access and reach the Hebraic heritage of everything in which we believe. And um, we uh, are uh, with you right now because we have this opportunity of doing something that really excites us a great deal. And that is helping people understand that the Bible is not just a history book. Uh, it's not a, a book about early archaeology. It's not a book of old stories and legends and mythologies about long forgotten people. No, it is a guidebook. It is a blueprint. It is a road map to life in every possible way. Look, let me give you an example. Uh, I grew up outside the United States of America. And when I arrived here, I had no idea of a game called baseball. No idea whatsoever. And uh, I was with a group of new friends, and they were trying to make me feel all at home. And what they told me was, we're going to play baseball. I said, okay, great, thanks very much. I don't know how to play, so how about I'll just sit on the sidelines and watch. No, 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 you've got to play. Next thing I knew, somebody had put a club into my hand, and they told me to stand somewhere, and another guy picks up a projectile and starts throwing it at me. So I just I held up this bat to try and protect myself and by some miracle the ball hit the bat instead of me and all of a sudden people start yelling run 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 I didn't know what they were talking about like run where somebody's after me so I started running not there the other way fine drop the bat I mean, you know what it was it was hair raising it was absolutely turbulent I didn't know what was going on but it did teach me a really good lesson and that is that games make much more sense when you know the rules. And that's a metaphor for life as well. You probably didn't get the most valuable player award either for that. You weren't very helpful. No, I really was not team. helpful. I, I was not helpful to anybody else. I was not helpful to myself. And you didn't have fun, probably. And I didn't have fun. So the lesson is that when we are living the game of life, you can either play knowing the rules or you can play ignoring the rules. And we believe that everybody has a better and a more fulfilling and a happier life when we play according to those rules. So what we really ought to do is, is give an example, because otherwise people are saying, what are they talking about? Well, one of the things that we love to share with people is the Hebrew language. And I, I'm assuming very few of you are actually fluent or even close to fluent in the Hebrew language. But Hebrew is unlike any other language, and it is the language that God gave the Bible in. It is the language that God created the world with. So it's not a surprise to us that God puts certain messages within the language itself. And that's one of the things that we really have a, a lot of fun sharing. Let me give you an example. Have you ever wondered where the alphabet came from? We've got, right, you have A, B, C, we teach kids, they sing a nice little song. Well, that comes from the Greek, alphabet, a gamma. Where did the Greek come from? Well, it came from the Hebrew. And you can even hear the similarity of the first four letters, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta. That's how it goes. But why? Why is there that order? Why don't we have vowels first and then consonants? Why do we have the, the order we do have? Well, wouldn't it be great if in English you could understand the meaning of words from the order of the letters? For example, a, we have AB and later on we have MN. Wouldn't it be great if AM, am, was mother and maybe BN would be child? Bun. Well, that's not what it is. We have mommy and child or mommy and son. We don't have am and bun. But you know what? We do have it in Hebrew. Right, and that's the magic of Hebrew. So you have the first, the letter, the first letter of the alphabet and one in the middle that spell aim, which is a mother, and then you have, if you go just to the very next letter after each one, after the 
ah comes the b sound. After the m comes the n sound. You know what the best like example of this is? There was, there was this movie, it's years ago already, <laughs> but it was um, uh, the 2001 Space Odyssey. And the evil computer in this movie, everybody who saw the movie, you just ask anybody, everybody remembers. Hal. Right. The name of the evil computer that was trying to take over the world was Hal. Not any Hal's out there. But H-A-L was the evil computer. And pretty soon people realized that there had been an advertising deal with IBM. Because because if you take the letters that make up HAL, H-A-L, and you shift up the alphabet, just one, H, H gives you I, I A, B, L, M. Guess Hal what? This is, is a hidden, hidden advertisement <laughs> for the dominant computer company of back in those days, which was IBM. So in the same way in Hebrew, um, the Hebrew word for mother is two letters, which if you just shift them up the alphabet once, you get the Hebrew word for child, and that's telling you God giving us a very important message because the word for father does not lead to the doesn't word doesn't lead for it child. to child, but it does suggest that what a mother is is somebody who's followed by a child, and that it's a natural relationship for a mother to feel a relationship for a child, for the child to feel a relationship to a mother. That's a natural thing. The unnatural relationship is a child and a father. And that's why it is that tragically in so many different parts of the United States of America, in so many parts of Canada and South America and Asia, in so many parts of the world, tragically the, the phenomenon of women who are raising children by themselves. Now, it would be so hard, right, for a woman to think of abandoning her child. It almost doesn't happen. It almost never happens. But unfortunately men who never receive uh, an injection of godly vision find it easy to impregnate a woman leave her with a child and take off because that link between them and the child and between the child and needs them to be built. needs to be there. built it's not there and that automatically comes out of the hebrew language that's the type of information that we enjoy sharing but we specifically, we were invited here to speak about a very specific teaching we did called Tower of Power, Decoding the Secrets of Babel. That's right, and this is and all about a lot of lot information of important information, and it's in uh, based on chapter 11 of Genesis, the first nine verses of people uh, who came to a new place, they left where they were, and inexplicably they feel compelled to build this massive a tower reaching up to the heavens and uh, an entire city and of course it doesn't end very well and so what we have to, to do is, uh, is is look at what some of the lessons are that we can extract from that particular story now one of the things I think we want to clarify here is that uh, there really seem to be two main ways for human societies to be structured Two ways that will work. Two ways that will work. Less. That's right, exactly. I and mean, anarchy uh, is a way, but it's not a structure, and it doesn't yeah, work. It's very uh, chaos, unpleasant. Chaos, chaos doesn't work, and you know, and even in a family, chaos doesn't work. Chaos works absolutely nowhere. And so, organizing human society, uh, you either have centrally controlled tyrannies, much like the Soviet Union used to be, much the way Cuba is, uh, and much the way many parts of the world tragically are moving in that direction. The idea that the centralized power of government is going to take care of anything and everything. And one of the ways that people who are drawn to this way of thinking feel is that if certain projects are too big for your government to solve, why that's not a problem what we'll do is we'll just get a whole group of governments together and they'll solve them all together we might call them perhaps shall we say the united nations and you really have a choice because as an individual you can believe and know that there is a god and that he has rules by which we can best relate to each other and you can believe in that god with the big g but if you don't if you take that god out of the picture you're left believing in the small g of government because we need something to organize us. We can't just everybody, all do everything everybody feels we the want need. to do. That's right. The, absolutely. We do need some, some method of being organized. That's exactly how it works. And, uh, and the, the, the amazing thing is there has never been found a Jewish or a Christian centrally controlled tyranny. In other words, incompatible with the Bible totally incompatible well let's go back to chapter 11 of, of Genesis yes, all right, and see if we can that. bring it out from there and one of the fascinating things in the story of the Tower of Babel is the whole idea that the ruler who is Nimrod and, and on our CD we don't have time to do everything today but on our CD we explain how we know that Nimrod is the ruler in Babel but one of the things he says is I want to build it we want to build a tower that'll reach the heavens and you say, wait a second, shouldn't he be trying to leave 
go away from the heavens. He should dig a tower into the ground. He he should, should he's be, trying to fight God. Why is he trying to but reach the heavens? But that's not possible. Can't do it. And it's first, he's competing with God. You cannot have no leadership. People don't. That's not comfortable for us. And so he has to displace God. He has to have you look up to him. And he will be in the heavens. And that's the purpose of the tower. And, you know, in the Soviet Union, there was an amazing thing they did. They used to take school children on their first day and they would say, let's pray to God for some candy. Now, these kids had never heard of God because, you know, now then the kids would close their eyes and put their heads down on the desk. And then they would, the, te they, the teacher would say, ah, oh, no God, no candy. And then they'd say, now, let's close our eyes and pray to Stalin. And the kids would close their eyes, and guess what? The teacher would go and sprinkle candy. Why couldn't she just say, look, Stalin has sent you a gift? No, it had to be coming down from the heaven. There had to be a feeling of there was some sort of mystical Well, it makes sense. And this comes, this comes out Stalin. of these verses as well, which is uh, if you're a tyrant and you want to set up your government and your tyranny, the last thing you want is independent human beings who feel that their only true authority is God. You want people who will look to you towards power. They have to leave God in now, order to believe in you. Now, why is it so important for everybody to understand these nine verses in chapter 11? I mean, why, why is it that important for people to recognize that in these nine verses of chapter 11, you will find the blueprint of how tyranny arises in a nation? Who cares? Because the Tower of Babel did not happen once. That is the prototype. And if you follow history, you can see it occurring in France after the revolution. You can see it in communist China. You can see it in ancient Greece. It's going to happen over and over and over again. And if you don't know that, you're not going to be prepared to get the clues to say, is it happening to me? Is it happening now in my life? And, uh, and there, there really are things that people can do to protect themselves. But above all, it's to understand the pattern. Uh, we, we enjoy it when we open the morning newspaper or we turn on the evening news where you look at what's happening or you read the story and you say to yourself, my goodness, this is straight out of the book of Genesis. I can see what's going on. And it makes prophecy more understandable as well because you can watch the unfolding of events. People think things just happen by random not of course they they happen because of God's biblical blueprint and if you know they're going to happen you can take the steps to avoid the ones you don't want to see happen so that gives you a little bit of an idea of why it is that we have prepared this very special Torah teaching on uh, not one but two audio CDs and um, along also with a full color 16 page study guide because we know that you probably do not know Hebrew but we want to still allow you to be able to probe into the Lord's language and identify some of the most amazing patterns even though you don't know Hebrew by the end of this you'll have a much better idea of how the Lord's language really does work so stay tuned because we're going to bring you a terrific message with more information on Tower of Power and then we'll be back If you've enjoyed the rich wisdom of Rabbi Daniel Lappin, then we invite you to delve deeper into the mysteries of Genesis with Tower of Power, decoding the secrets of Babel. This Torah teaching best yields its secrets when conveyed by the voice from the rabbi's lips to his students' ears. This audio series includes The Curse of the Skyscraper, Baseball with Cain and Abel, and Pharaoh and the European Economic Community. This handsomely packaged volume includes a Hebrew language study guide too. To order, call 866-338-5033. And for your donation of $50 or more to TCT, you too can still enjoy Rabbi Lappin's easy blend of wisdom and humor while gaining powerful tools for defending your family, faith, and finances. Reserve your audio volume of Tower of Power today. Well, hi, we're back, and uh, I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin, my wife Susan. Uh, our ministry is the American Alliance of Jews and Christians, uh, trying hard to build the bridges on the solid foundation of Scripture, on the solid foundation of the Bible, 
which was such an essential part of the building up of the United States of America, where virtually every colonial pastor, every, virtually every colonial church had people who understood Hebrew, the Lord's language. And the uh, Torah teaching that we're bringing you right now has to do with chapter 11 of Genesis, the first nine verses, the extraordinary story of the Tower of Power, the Tower of Babel, the mechanism by means of which the evil Nimrod was able to seize control over the entire population of the period to literally become a tyrant who wished to control every aspect of his people's lives. And I want to look at uh, the very beginning, just verses 1 and 2, and uh, if you had a chance to glance at them, you would know that it would speak about the fact that uh, all the people came from the east. And it's, it's really puzzling we because... Go, should people go get a map? Um, <laughs> well, it certainly wouldn't, wouldn't hurt to have a map, but, or at least to have an idea that when you're looking at most maps and north is on the top, then usually west is on your left and east is on your right. And what's important about that is that uh, as we're told that the story of the Tower of Babel begins and it says they came from the east, the real question is who cares? I mean, did it matter where they came from? If they came from the south, did that matter? Well, of course it didn't matter. But one of the things that you have to learn from the outset when you really are trying to absorb ancient Jewish wisdom is that in the Hebrew of the five books of Moses, directions are not just directions. They always have moral implications. So, for instance, at the end of the book of Jonah, you'll read about the people of the city of Nineveh who didn't know their right hands from their left hands. That's not just they couldn't, you know, they never knew which hand to put the watch on. No, n not at all. Right and left were always metaphors for good and evil. That's what it stood for. East takes us back to the original connection with God. That's what East always means throughout the Torah. And that's why it is that when uh, Lot and Abraham parted from one another, uh, Lot left Abraham to travel toward the East towards the city of Sodom and the valley of the Jordan. And in the, the verse in chapter 13 of Genesis tells us that Lot journeyed from the east. When anybody who looks at a map knows he was traveling toward the east. This is such a powerful observation that unfortunately many English translations translated they so actually that it lie. Sense. They actually change it. They make it read and Lot traveled to the east. It doesn't Not say what that. the Hebrew says. In the Hebrew text, it's very clear. Lot traveled from the east and towards the city. But he wasn't traveling from the east. Geographically, he was traveling to the east. That's because east always means original connection with God. Abraham was his mentor. Abraham was his teacher. The minute Lot decided to move to Sodom, it didn't make any difference which direction he was traveling in. He was traveling away from the east. That's all there is and to it. Back to our generation of Babel, when we say, when it's the sentence starts and says they traveled from the east, you should be hearing warning bells ringing in your head. They're going from the east. They are moving away from a connection with God. Yeah, bad to a news. New beginning. <laughs> That's a really it's bad. Not news. Going Anytime to be a good you one. read and they journeyed from the east, that means bad things are about to happen. And by the way, uh, back in the beginning of the story of Garden of Eden, at the end when Adam and Eve are, uh, are evicted from the Garden of Eden, uh, God placed um, guardians to keep the way open to the Garden of Eden on the east of the Garden of Eden. In other words, identifying this idea that back to Eden, back to this original connection with God is always eastward. Well, Chapter 11, Genesis, Tower of Babel story. Everybody journeyed away from the east. Dum, da, dum, dum. Now we know, <laughs> we know not good things are about to be happening right now. That's one very important thing. And so we're not surprised by what happens. We're not surprised that a few verses later, God himself looks down and says, uh-uh, <laughs> this isn't going to fly. And uh, the second thing that is, is also very important to notice at the beginning is it says the people were of Devarim Achadim. Now, that's the Hebrew word, the Hebrew phrase for the people were of few words or few things. That Hebrew word devarim is either words or things. Now, I don't know about your English translation. Does it say words or things? I have no idea, but I will tell you what the original Hebrew says. The people had few 
possessions. They had few objects. They had few things. Do you know why that is? You probably do. Remember, this is now the pattern of the emergence of socialism. Socialism is a reality in the world. From the very beginnings, all the way back to chapter 11, the human yearning for socialism, this human yearning for fairness and equality and, and safety, security and safety, security. right, will always tug people who may be decent, well-intentioned, good people, but will always tug them towards socialism. Which invariably tugs them away from God. Away from God, because there's no such thing as a socialist government that is religious. It's on the contrary. Socialist governments are always anti-religious. As a matter of fact, if you ever notice a government developing a war with the faiths of the Bible, you must know it's heading towards socialism. That is its ultimate goal. Because anybody knows, any good Nimrodian knows, that in order to develop a central controlled tyranny, you've got to, first of all, extirpate God from the population. Well, if you are successful and you build a socialist uh, society, guess what the people possess? Very few things. Right. Get it? Even more so if we, because that's the first verse of chapter 11. And if you go, so let's go back to chapter 10. In chapter 10, it's talking about the spreading out of Noah's grandchildren. And they each go into groups. They have a tribal society. And tribal societies are better than living by yourself. Having a family is better than being alone. Having a group of your families is better than having just one family. And that's what a tribe is. It's not really successful. There are societies today, as you say, in Africa, in the Middle East, that are built on tribal, a tribal nature. Let's be honest. I mean, no tribal society has ever figured out how to manufacture a bicycle. Not even cornflakes. Not even cornflakes. I mean, Novocaine was not... I mean, Novocaine, right? It's a good thing to have if you have to have tooth work. That wasn't invented and by any tribal society. And what happens in a tribal society? Everything belongs to the tribe. So the individual... They're people of few things, and that leads people more, leaves people wanting more. And when people are dissatisfied, that is also socialism and a leader and a tyrant can step in and promise things. Basically, folks, the thing to do is to get used to the idea that the Bible, and you probably know this already, the Bible is like the manufacturer's instruction manual. You know when you get a new car and you open the glove box and you find that nice booklet in there and all shiny. If you're lucky, it comes in a little leather binder with a zip. And uh, you open that up and it tells you all there is to know about operating the car properly. You can ignore it if you like. You might decide that the suggestion of replacing the oil every 3,000 miles or every 5,000 miles, that's a really dumb idea. We're not doing that. Well, guess what? It's probably not going to be too many years down the road uh, that you're going to wish you had done that. The Bible is exactly like that. Manufacturer's instruction manual. Um, God knows that we human beings do best when we own possessions. Society works best when everything belongs to somebody. Have you ever noticed that things that belong to the public... They're kind of like nobody owns them. And even charity. Charity is dependent on my having something. If I don't own anything, I can't choose to share it. Yes, exactly. And so, I mean, that, that's right. Don't covet is the 10th commandment. If everything belongs to everybody, there's nothing, nothing to covet. The, the biblical blueprint, the instruction manual from our great manufacturer in heaven, uh, is very clear about this. Possessions are important. They are good things. It's good for us to have possessions. It's good. And so when a society begins to develop along the idea of taking away your ability to acquire possessions and promises in return that it will take care of you, it will take care of your medicine and it'll take care of your doctor, it'll take care of your retirement and it'll educate housing, your children. It'll your oh, it'll, it'll give you your housing. Whatever you need, all you've got to do is give us all your money. We'll take care of you. Kind of like the dairy farmer who says to the cow, you give me all your milk and I'll give you the hay and the pasture. And indeed, if we are nothing but animals, if we were not touched by the finger of God, we're just like animals, then yes, we do need a zookeeper uh, or a, uh, a farmer who will look after us. And here's the funny thing. Have you noticed the farmer always lives in a nicer house than the cows do? <laughs> That's right. He's not right? in the barn with yeah. the cows. Have you noticed that uh, when socialist governments offer you things like uh, medicine and schooling for your children, their own children always go to better schools? And they very often don't subject themselves to the same laws. They pass laws for you and for me, 
But if you're in the ruling class, you actually don't have to follow those laws. That's exactly how it is. And all of this laid out as clearly as you could wish in the magical nine verses of, first nine verses of chapter 11 of Genesis. And that which we lay out in a way that we obviously cannot do in the short time we have together here right now. But we lay that out over the course of several hours of material that you can take with you to the gym if you work out because we believe that we all have to look after the bodies that God allowed us to use. Um, you, can, you can have it with you in the car while you're driving and that's all fine. All of these things are, uh, are ways to, um, to, to use fully the time opportunities that we have because we really want you to be able to absorb the fullness of the message of the Tower of Power and all of that is available but what we want you to do is stay tuned because we're going to be telling you exactly how you can get your own copy of Rabbi Daniel Lappin's Tower of Power Decoding the Secrets of Babel. If you've enjoyed the rich wisdom of Rabbi Daniel Lappin then we invite you to delve deeper into the mysteries of Genesis with Tower of Power, Decoding the Secrets of Babel. This Torah teaching best yields its secrets when conveyed by the voice from the rabbi's lips to his students' ears. This audio series includes The Curse of the Skyscraper, Baseball with Cain and Abel, and Pharaoh and the European Economic Community. This handsomely packaged volume includes a Hebrew language study guide too. To order, call 866-338-5033. And for your donation of $50 or more to TCT, you too can still enjoy Rabbi Lappin's easy blend of wisdom and humor while gaining powerful tools for defending your family, faith, and finances. Reserve your audio volume of Tower of Power today. Well, we would really like you to be blessed with the Tower of Power, decoding the secrets of Babel, so as that you too can gain some of the thrill and the excitement of probing beneath the surface to see some of the embedded secrets that lie treasured within the Lord's language within Hebrew. And uh, you're going to see a telephone number on your screen, which is the number to call so as that you can become part of this living experience of getting to know Scripture in the Lord's language, even though you probably don't know any Hebrew yet. But stay with us, because you will discover things you never suspected could be found deep within ancient Jewish wisdom, and as revealed right here in the Tower of Power, Decoding the Secrets of Babel. This has been a TCT Network exclusive production. If you would like to see more exclusive special programs, send your support to TCT, PO Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959.